All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Scalability Podcast. Uh, and today I have a really interesting guest. Uh, his name is Philip Roberts. What's going on, man? Not much. Welcome to the Scalability Podcast, your go-to resource for those who want to profitably grow their business and life beyond the limits of your personal time, energy, and skills. All right, so he is actually the CEO of a company called Goals, which stands for? Goal-Oriented Academics and Learning Sciences. And on top of that, there's, I believe, three other companies that you run. uh, Two other companies. Um, uh, So it's sort of a family of companies. So there's uh, Goal-Oriented Academics and Learning Sciences, um, uh, and there's um, Goals Therapy, and there's Goals Foundation. Perfect. So the, the trio, right? So um, with that being said, uh, you know, so Philip, he grew up in a very wealthy family. He's from, um, you know, he has all this generational wealth, a trust fund baby. <laughs> I, I'm just, we're actually from the same side of San Jose. We're both from the hood. I grew up with nothing. I, can you tell us about yourself? Yeah. Um, so I'm Philip. I, um, uh, as he said, I grew up from, from deep, deep financial pockets or maybe quite the opposite. <laughs> Um, uh, from a family of people that loved learning, that loved, um, that loved education, that, that um, loved teaching people how to teach, uh, but didn't have a lot of the classical education, a lot of the classical training. So um, my, when I was young, I helped my family rebuild the, um, the homestead that my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, um, moved across from the East Coast on covered wagons. We helped rebuild the covered wagon and like uh, re- rebuilt the homestead that he was was um, raised at, and that my my great grandfather and my grandfather were born at this one room little thing. Mm-hmm. We found like peaches still in jars di- uh, dug <laughs> deep in the ground. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, didn't grow up with a whole a whole lot of traditional training and traditional money and and that kind of stuff. So. Um, uh, my family always worked hard, hustled really hard. My mom um, helped start a, a welding company when she was like 17 or 18. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, people always just just figured it out and worked and loved learning, loved reading and, and yeah. never stopped learning. Yeah, and you know what, that was, um, <clears throat> so when I met you, like there was a term that uh, that came out, or not that came out, but like that I was introduced to, right? Like I had never heard the term neurodiverse, mm-hmm. right? Um, and when I started learning more about uh, you and your business, uh, that's kind of like the, the specialty of what you guys do. You guys will work with anybody, mm-hmm. but you have uh, a specialty in working with neurodiverse individuals. So can you, for, the, for those of, uh, for the people who are listening who don't know what neurodiverse is, can you fill us in? Yeah, absolutely. So, neurodiverse is um, it's uh, leaning into a term um, really f- uh, developed by a, a one of the greatest biologists of the the past hundred years, uh, E.O. Wilson. Um, uh, he um, invented the term um, biodiversity, mm. and uh, neurodiverse is sort of leaning into the understanding that. Um, that he, Harvard-trained scientist, um, uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, um, uh, developed. So neurodiversity is the idea and understanding that there is a broad spectrum of minds that exist in this world. Um, Just like um, with biodiversity, there are a broad diversity of of biological creatures, and within a species, uh, there there can be significant uh, biologic diversity. Um, neurodiversity is that there are a broad variety of mind types and sort of the neurodiversity movement and the pe- people that, that believe in the importance of this, um, as, as do I and my, uh, my organizations, um, 
is that um, not only is there a broad diversity of types of minds in this world, uh, that is really powerful for the species. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I mentioned to you before about if we look at cheetahs his, um, and their biological diversity, there was a, a significant bottleneck, I don't know, 10,000 years ago or so, and it went down to there, there weren't very many cheetahs left in, yeah. in the world. And so with cheetahs, um, if th there's not a lot of, lot of biological diversity of the species, and so if there's a disease that one cheetah gets, like most of the other cheetahs, even though the, the cheetah population has expanded, a lot of cheetahs can get it. So um, it's not a really healthy diversity of that species. But for with neurodiversity, um, there is a s strength in the fact that we have a lot of different types of minds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so what we have, and, and I think uh, this, this is sort of how we got excited talking about some of the similar things. Mm -hmm. um, our society is not developed in such a way to um, support a diversity of minds. It's, it's really a Henry Ford production model of, yep. of education, um, of, okay, like, he, all, like, everything moves down the track, you put your little thing in, mm -hmm. everybody's supposed to sit down, shut up, stare straight ahead. There's a lot of lip service given to the concept of multimodal teaching, which is supposed to be like teaching in a bunch of different ways to, for a bunch of different mind types, but it's a bunch of crap. Do, do, it's how, not how really much, happening. Well, back, in, back in those days for uh, you know, the Ford era, how much, um, how much influence did companies like Ford and all these other companies have on the education system? I'm not a historian. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't want to worship. I. Yeah. I don't know. But, um, I believe that our modern education system is, to a great degree, a production of the need to build mm -hmm. um, an educated workforce that can support um, that our our economy's needs. Yeah. And so, um, I believe what it appears to me that we have a system that's really developed to train people to be the next generation of workers. Correct. If Correct. at the lower systems of education, I, I think we have a really phenomenal system of, of higher education. I think um, there have been few places that have our level of, of quality there, but I think below that it's, it's really training workers to be workers. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, um, when, when I think about uh, when I think about that, right? Like, so myself among so many other entrepreneurs, like we, we constantly communicate that you know we feel like we never fit in in school, um, and a lot of times too, like a lot of our parents were in denial about you know that hey maybe we could be different, right? And so it's not that we're different that we're bad. We don't do our homework because we're we're bad. We don't uh, and difference is bad, right? It, it, different according to that system. Right. Um, and also, you know, and, and also talking to, and when you say like neurodiverse, right? So if we were to give like labels to what is neurodiverse, because uh, is ADHD neurodiverse? Absolutely. What? Absolutely. So, so um, in my understanding and my usage of the term, when I use it, because um, different people use it in different ways, um, I am trained as a scientist. I um, uh, studied cognitive neuroscience. I, I, um, and so I look at things often through the lens of math and science. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, in my mind, neurodiversity um, diversity is the, the understanding that there is a broad spectrum of minds and that um, most cognitive traits s fall along what tends to be a sort of normal bell curve. Mm -hmm. And so one standard deviation covers about 68% and two standard deviations, blah, 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 that, that, that standard bell curve. And so um, neurodiverse is understanding that, um, that there is that bell curve mm -hmm. for most traits 
um, in cognition, for most ways, m most of the ways that a brain works. Mm -hmm. And there are so many different ways. There's, there's, um, you can talk about short-term memory, you can t talk about long-term memory, and people might be stronger with short-term memory and fall on one side of a spectrum, uh, one side of that bell curve for short-term or working memory. Mm -hmm. And some person, some people may have really, like, may not be so strong on one, but might have really strong um, sort of long-term crystallized memory. Um, and so if we, f uh, that, that broad diversity of traits, so neurodiverse is just understanding that that is the case. And then there is a term also called neurodivergent, which many people use to mean falling outside of, of like certain standard deviations from on that bell curve. Okay. Um, and so, um, so if, if you're uh, what somebody would call neurotypical, it would fall like near the middle of that range, like at the peak of the, the, that bell curve. Um, and um, if you were neurodivergent, it would be sort of standard deviations outside of that range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. So layman's terms, right? So basically, uh, so neurotypical is going to be your um, probably like your average person who... The, like, exactly. Neurotypical is your brain sort of works the average way that most people's brains tend to work. Got it. Okay. And then... Um, um, so, you know, it's funny, we were watching, it's not funny, but we were watching a, a great show called Atypical, right? Okay. Uh, a guy living with, uh, with autism and, you know, like, do we, we, we got addicted to that show and seeing like his progression, uh, you know, seeing his progression through school. So what, what, what is atypical then? Is that just the opposite of neurotypical? Um, atypical is not a term that, that I personally use. Uh -huh. Um, I, I don't necessarily have any any like issues with the use of it but it's just not something that that i that i personally have used so in my mind hearing the term it it to me sounds like um it would be um if you were using that to mean um something on on cognitive spectrums then i would probably be um synonymous with neurodivergent uh, atypical in hearing it to my ears just seems like outside of the standard deviation of, yeah. of the thing. Nice. So, um, so coming back to, uh, coming back to like, a, I want to use myself as an example, right? Um, you, talking to you, since we talked to you last time uh, we can, uh, we discussed IEP plans, right? And, um, you know, now my son is like in the process, like they've, mm -hmm. Uh, they've already started the process. Um, we're getting, um, I, I just read an email that he's being seen by like a few different people in school, right? But, um, you, you know, my son, okay, Com coming back to me, like I, I wish that, um, you know, instead of like, I guess being, I guess kind of ousted, right? Or like being told that I'm a bad kid. I wish that somebody would have put me on an IEP plan because, you know, I, I think my future would have been so much different right now, right? Because I, I, I never had a problem with school. I just had a problem um, with things I didn't like in school, right? Um, but for, I wish I could have became a lawyer or actually I, that's what I really wanted to be was a lawyer, right? Um, but because... Uh, you still can't. Probably, but now I hire lawyers. <laughs> you know, it's like now it's like, it's just there's a, there's a, when you get to a certain point in business, it's like, the golden handcuffs. <sighs> yeah, well, it's just like I could go do this, but what am I giving up? Like, what what are the things I'm putting aside in order to to, to go that path? Yeah, yeah, because it's like unless I'm going to be a lawyer for funsies, <laughs> you know, like it's it, I'm most people become lawyers not just for the passion of the industry, but because they want to make a lot of money, whatever a lot of money is for a lawyer, right? But it's like I figured that out. <laughs> I figured that part out. I've, you know, um, at least I'm on, on track to figure out that out. Um, but so coming back to, uh, coming back to what we're talking about, like not, so you also had your own challenges growing up too, and you're an entrepreneur now. Um, the way that we met was you had actually hired my senior advisor, Richard Tam. Um, and you know, Richard Tam is very, very passionate about education. 
like what, very passionate. I got the chip on my shoulder. I'm like, I hate education because of what the system did to me. I'm like, screw that. Don't doesn't matter. But and you know my. Then my you should be mad about it. You should be mad about Tell it. Me about we it. failed you, and we failed so many people. Um, uh, you you and I grew up in the same side of town. Yeah. Um, a lot of there were truly passionate educators were were um, growing up, uh, but so many of them weren't, and so many of them had tapped out. Maybe so many of them had gone into it with with a desire to help, mm -hmm. but structurally the supports weren't there. So there wasn't a lot of money for education. There, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of money for books. There wasn't a lot of money for, and working in a system, and, and I, I worked in the public edu education system for quite a while before I got frustrated with it and, and stepped out. Um, but I, I think it's, hmm, ooh. All right, so I think our system to fund education is absolutely fucked up. I think our system to fund education the, um, based on the property values in the area and property taxes. And so if, you, if you're if you rich and you have a rich house and you live in a rich area, um, the taxes from all of those expensive houses go to fund a smaller group of people. Mm. And so... so um, Is that how it you, works? That's how it works. Huh. And so where we grew up, where the houses didn't cost a whole lot of money, we had a whole lot of kids in the same schools with a lot less money going to them. Wow. I had no fucking clue that that's how the money was spread apart. So east side San Jose, even to this day, you can ha find houses in the six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars ranges, right? Um, here in Cupertino, I'm looking at my fucking neighbor's houses, 2.5, 4, some even $5 million. So you're saying because these people are paying higher property property taxes, that's why these schools are better funded. You know, my... Uh, so. Yes, uh, that, that's a big part of the funding. But also, um, if you are, um, and I believe that you should be able to donate to the, the schools that your kids go to. You should be able to give money and have that used to, to support your, your uh, public school system. Um, uh, but um, that is another uh, benefit that um, living in a wealthy area um, people have additional resources to be able to contribute to the school, and so um, they're often donating the schools. Dude, I, I saw the sign in front of my son's school. It's like, we raise, how much would, did they raise there? 60000 something like that? $60,000, $80,000? Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, like, on the east side, we'd be lucky if we can raise, like, $6,000. They got these kids doing all of these fundraisers that don't even work because the kids don't do anything. Like, that's interesting. Okay, keep yeah. going. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and again, if you continue to look at it, if, if you're in an area that has wealthy people whose, whose parents are the bosses of the, of the blah, blah, blah of, uh, in industry, then when you hang out at your buddy's house, you're, you're hanging out with a buddy whose dad is a CEO of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, and so um, families um, contribute not just financially, but they contribute with time, which is another thing that um, our parents, my parents didn't have a lot of. They were hustling. They were working really hard to, to, to put a roof over our head, to feed us, to do these kinds of things. And so there wasn't a lot of extra time to just contribute to school, to just spend on those things. Um, dude, dude I, you're just like, you're hitting, so, you're, you're just hitting so many chords inside of me right now. It's kind of like, like, you talk about the time, like, dude, like, I fucking, like, why did I get into so much trouble? Like, my mom was always working. You know, I leave, I would leave school, come home, be by myself, or, you know, go out and fucking do stupid shit, you know? And, like, then my mom would come home at night, and she'd fucking cook. We would, you know, then she'd yell at me for not doing my homework, fucking stand over my shoulder for, like, an hour yelling at me, like, you know, and then, uh... Yeah, and, you know, it's crazy, like, was, we're here in Cupertino now, and my son went on, like, a fucking three-day field trip, and I was like, what? Like, a three-day, like, science camp or whatever, and we, we didn't fucking have three-day science camps. <laughs> the fuck? 
they don't have the money for it. Yeah, like, uh, and and then I'm, you know, I'm starting to meet like all of the parents, and yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's interesting, man. And you're you're the first person who's ever told me like I've I've always had a chip on my shoulder that I've never talked about. I've always had it on my shoulder. Like I've I've never like I. <clears throat> I hate college, I hate the school system, I hate it, not because it's bad, because I didn't get to be a part of it. Yeah, I, so growing up where we did, um, as I said, there were a lot of people who at least started off passionate, who were, who were really invested in, in, in us. Um, and I had, I, had te I had a teacher, she was, you could never hope for a better teacher. She, her family moved to Colorado. She ended up living in Colorado and she flew every week back to teach us in the ghetto mm. um, because she didn't want to abandon us. She, she flew so many times, one of her eyes blew up and she had to live in a closet at home. Other, the only time she came into light was when she was teaching us in the classroom and then she went back to, to, to having like a face mask because of the damage that light was causing to her eyes, but she wasn't going to wow. give up, up on us. So I'm not saying there weren't people who were truly, deeply committed to us as people and wanting to support us, but so many, so many maybe had tapped out and had been frustrated by the structural challenges. So when, oh, this is, this is frustrating. So food, if you have kids that are hungry, they can't pay attention. If you have a hungry kid, and kids are often hungry, but if the primary nutrition they're getting is at school, and it's garbage, and it's small quantities, and it's, if you have hungry kids, they won't be able to sit and pay attention. If you have kids that are struggling, that don't have warm enough clothes, how is a cold kid gonna sit in class and pay attention? It's, these are major challenges, and I think a lot of the, the teachers struggled with the day-to-day -day just getting the basic engagement and managing kids that, that dealt with such structural trauma in their lives to just be able to sit and pay attention long enough to hear the lessons, much less support them to move past it. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Yeah, this is, um, hmm. we've got some issues with our system. Well, yeah, I, and when it comes to teachers, like, I, I will never deny that I had some amazing teachers. The, you know, I've, I think it was very clear to me that there was a lot of teachers while I was in school who were like, okay, fuck, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to teach you this shit, but obviously their ideas were not aligned with that. Um, like, one teacher, uh, you know, one teacher, for example, like, he would spend his time, like, he would spend his time, like, there's this game called Warcraft, um, and you, you know, you freaking paint figures, and it's a strategy game, um, but he would basically, like, convince students to, like, hey, come after school, instead of going home and getting in trouble, whatever, like, hang out with me for two, three hours, and it was interesting, the lessons that he taught us about strategy, uh, about even art, about, you know, like, he would, it's like, we were there doing stuff, but it was, and obviously, like, it wasn't, like, a school thing, you know what I mean, like, it was his own, uh, his own way of uh, like nurturing us, right? And that was cool. Um, but and, and I've, I've had I've had multiple examples of uh, of really great teachers. Man, I remember in high school I was a great football player. I never got to play a game though because my grades were always too bad. Like I, I only got to go to practice. You know, um, you know my coach Sandoval, uh, teacher and coach Sandoval at Silver Creek High School, I remember he was like always trying to help me. I just like, dude, just wasn't like fucking clicking for me. Wasn't clicking for me. And then like now as an adult, like in business, what's the math that I do? I do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's it. Percentages is just multiplication or division, whatever, right? Um, it's like, I was over here, they're over here trying to teach me how to do algebra and fucking geometry and all this bullshit that I just don't get. Um, but now it's like not even being used in my real life anymore. Um, but anyways, dude, that's, that's interesting. So, okay. Goals does something about that. You know, you, you talked about some techniques that you use with your students that I've never like heard of. 
right? Uh, I've, I've, as an adult, I've started to understand like how movement is important, uh, but I didn't, I didn't know that movement and learning is like a thing. Mm. I didn't know like you, you. There was some tactics. Can, can you, can you go over like some of the tactics that like you guys practice at goals? So, um, goals believes in science. Goals believes in evidence-based practices. So. We try to keep up to date with um, modern education theory, with modern uh, psychology theory. Um, we uh, we try to stay up to date on um, uh, modern understanding in neuroscience and uh, how it applies um, in in with all the things that we do. So um, the core of what we try to do is really figure out how does each person's brain work. So we have this person in front of us that we're here to help. First thing, it starts with 100% buy-in. We're not willing to work with anybody. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna disrespect somebody by trying to force something on them that they don't want, that they're not ready for. Um, it's also maybe an evil, dirty business practice because um, part of why um, I think we're reasonably well respected in the industry. Um, I think a lot of that is because we get such really strong results. Um, we do a really good job helping people to sort of figure out what's working, what will work for them and, and figure out how to be successful and how to go kick ass, take names and become evil dictators and take over the world. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is where Dr. Evil went to school. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so we, we work, um, I, I think it all starts with number one buy-in. Um, you can. I, I think there's there's beauty in traditional proverbs. There's reasons why certain certain sayings are are carried from generation to generation. Um, and so uh, we've um, heard heard the phrase: "You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink." Yep. Um, and and there's a profound beauty in the in that simplicity it's that like you can you can take somebody and you can give them options but you can't shove it down the throat and Correct. it's so that that's a big piece with education and also with with life change with life transformation if your goal is to help somebody figure out a way to change the way they approach life and learning and and all of the things it has to first start with an internal desire with a recognition that, all right, maybe some of the stuff I was doing wasn't working quite so well for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe let's figure out a, a, a better, a different way. So we first start with consent, uh, with, with making sure that they, they're down for what can usually be a heavy lifting, challenging thing. As we all know, like, oh my God, um, I, I had a kid, um, uh, well, I did not have a kid, um, <laughs> partner right. had a kid, uh, and, and, but like for everybody, everybody puts on a couple of pounds, every, like that, sure. that whole, that whole, whole thing, um, getting back into a healthy routine of, of exercise of, of, um, as my toddler says, no more fat dad, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that e even from somebody who's historically loved exercise and, and those things. So. Um, it, it takes some work. You've got to be ready for it. It, it, um, it takes some work. So um, with goals, it starts with um, are the things working for you? If not, let's, let's work on figuring out what will work and, uh, for you based on the way your brain works and then um, getting into the habits of doing consistently those things that do work. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, after that, then we work with people to really spend time understanding their brain. That can be leaning into if there's, um, if there's data on the way that their brain works. So mm. if there's uh, psy psychoeducational evaluations or neuropsych evaluations. What do you mean by data? Like what, what, like what, what is it, like are you talking about like I come here and I have ADHD? What data is it? What data is there behind? That? Yeah. So, so um, uh, 
for there to be a diagnosis of ADHD, mm -hmm. there needs to have been an assessment by somebody who is legally qualified to give that diagnosis. Correct. So it could be a developmental pediatrician. It could be a neuropsychologist. It could be um, a psychotherapist. It could be um, any of those, those that are qualified to give an assessment mm -hmm. and um, make a determination that that's the case. So you're saying when I came, when I come in here with that assessment that I have this, you're, you guys are, you guys have plans based off of like that diagnosis on like how to effectively teach this person who has. Yeah, mostly. So, um, I believe in science. I believe that, that there are, that, there is a usefulness to putting, to like having a categorization of, of, of a thing. So, um, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, um, ADHD, uh, it's, I don't know. Um, there are, there's three specific like um, types. There's primarily an attentive type, primarily hyperactive type, and there's combined type. <laughs> um, uh, which is a, a lovely combination of the both. And to give that, th there, are, there are tests that are, that, that are standardized tests that are given that there are certain questions. And if you check enough of the boxes of the, the blah, 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 then it, then it sort of fits under the label of um, ADHD mm -hmm. of whatever those types are. Um, I believe, going back to that term neurodiversity, mm -hmm. that most things in life, most cognitive traits are a spectrum. So I believe there's an anxiety spectrum that, mm -hmm. that people fall yeah. somewhere. And I believe that what we term a disorder mm -hmm. means um, that it is outside of say, sort of that neurotypical range, yeah. sufficiently far enough outside of that neurotypical range, and also causes distress and challenges for the person. So just because your brain doesn't work exactly the same way everybody else's does, um, like within X standard deviations of that norm, mm -hmm doesn't mean that that it's necessarily disorder so you're saying like okay for example just a, a few common ones sure. depression yeah. everybody gets depressed period yep. everybody gets depressed but there are certain people who get depressed and can't get out of bed for a week like that's like higher on the spectrum versus exactly someone who just like oh i'm sad uh my fucking ice cream fell right just kidding. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty low. But, uh, and then there's like anxiety too, uh, who, you know, people just, uh, anxiety is normal. I forgot my fucking homework or I'm nervous about doing a speech or something. The anxiety versus like anxiety like I was driving and I almost crashed my damn car because I couldn't breathe. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Got it. And so um, to some extent, actually, uh, Pretty cool. Uh, people who are sort of higher on the anxiety spectrum um, often are more successful financially. Mm. Uh, um, I, I think that's probably because they're like take have more attention to detail. They're like making sure that they blah 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 blah. Like all, all the kinds of things that somebody who like wants to make sure that they're doing things right and double checking and triple checking to make sure that they that they on on the test circled the right bubble rather than uh, maybe me when I was younger and uh, I was like, oh, I know that. And then without reading that next one down, it's like, oh, yeah, clearly that, that's the better choice. But yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the double edged sword. Ex exactly. So, um, yeah. So 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 with the anxiety, with the depression, uh, the, these are there's a normal range for for what this what this is um, for, for what we experience as humans. Um, and then if it's significantly outside of that and it is causing challenges for the person, um, then I think that's how we define 
something as a disorder. So coming back to goals and when you guys are bringing people in, um, so you or people are categorized and based off of these categories, you guys, through your scientific knowledge, uh, know the best ways to help that brain, right? Like, so if... Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. So, so well, um, uh, thanks. You're, you're, you're so much better keeping me on track than I am. Oh, that's um, cool. I've been so, doing this for a little while. <laughs> uh, so... Um, what uh, as, you, as as we're talking about, um, somebody gives a, a categorization if there's a disorder or, or whatever, um, and not necessarily um, a disorder. There are so uh, we we talked about a couple of different types of people and uh, types of testing that, that can be done. So, with um, as we said with the uh, with ADHD, there there's a test that you can um, uh, give for ADHD, and you can look at the number of boxes that are checked. Um, and if it hits enough of them, it's officially categorized as ADHD, whatever subtype. Um, but that um, if you're like one less than that, you're just really high, um, uh, it wouldn't officially be categorized as ADHD. It would just be sort of, high, in, in my mind, sort of high on the spectrum, just about. It doesn't, yeah. Mm. So, um, there are other types of testing that can be done that can evaluate other aspects of cognition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, let's take, for instance, a, neuro, a neuropsych eval can evaluate quite a broad number of things about how a person's brain works. Yeah. And so if you look at the data from that, um, you can see if they have very strong this kind of piece of their, uh, of their cognition. Um, but not so strong on this, you can build, you, there are, number one, some teaching strategies designed for um, certain uh, mind types that, so people who are stronger at this particular kind of thing, there is evidence that X thing can, can often help them. Mm -hmm. But um, as, as we said before, this, this is all, um, it's all a spectrum and, um, people don't fit neatly inside of boxes. And so... See, hold that thought real quick because you just made me think about something. When I first walked in your office, you have the, all the fucking walls are like whiteboards, okay? And there's like random drawings everywhere. Like kids just go crazy in your office, like, uh, you know, with that. And then like the way that, uh, you know, I just saw all kinds of different, different kinds of seats and stuff like that. And, um, you know, you guys are like a competitor to that company, Kumon, right? You guys both tutor. Uh, I know, I know, I know that there's a Ferrari and that, that there, there's a Honda. I know, but but I'm <laughs> look. The thing is, like, I, I just it just made me think about how, like, uh, growing up, I just I, I have trouble sitting still. I still like right now. I feel pretty calm. Okay, but like, there's times where just I cannot sit still. If you look at some of these podcasts, I'm like freaking screaming around in my chair, moving around constantly. Like, I, I like I, I have trouble. Uh, especially when I'm trying to pay attention to something. Uh-huh, uh, yeah. <laughs> moving uh, around. I'm, I'm listening. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he's, he's getting up right now. Uh, Mike's still recording. But pretty much... Um, I'm listening. Let's <laughs> yeah, he's bringing out the chair. If, if you want, you can, you can sit and bounce in that. Yeah, um, see, see <laughs> and, and this is where, like, um, you know, this is, like, if you guys, if, if someone's coming here, and you know that, for example, they have like ADHD. They're very, mm -hmm. I don't know if the word squeamish. They don't, they don't stop fucking moving, right? Like you're not gonna force them to sit at a fucking desk and tutor them on a desk. Oh right? heck no. Yeah. Can okay. I have one of those? What is that? Uh, these are cough drops. Yeah, let, me, um, let me get one of these, man. Are they are, uh, they, uh, are they medicated? No, it's just just uh, <laughs> just lemon cough drops. Um, kind of water. I never shut up. Um, so. Thank you. So yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's funny that you mentioned the whiteboards. Um, I also have ADHD. Uh, and there's a really funny story. I, I just found this out a couple of years ago that my mother, um, when I was young, um, she, you. before you. the start of school every year, and I just found this out a couple of years ago, uh, that my mom, every year before I started with a new teacher, she would sit the teacher down and say, look, this is my son. My son is probably one of the smartest people you will ever teach. He will usually get the highest grade on every test. 
but he will never sit down in his chair. Hmm. He, it is not acceptable for him to be speaking out of turn in class. It's not okay for him to be interrupting other people doing their work. But you can never ask him to sit down in his chair because it will never happen. And, it, and yeah. So, um, <clears throat> is, is I, this you? Yeah, this is me. <laughs> this is me. Um, so, God, I, that kind of advocacy for your kids is so powerful. One of the things that we do um, with parent coaching is, is teaching parents how to understand their, their, their kid. Wait, wait, as wait, we, wait, wait. Yes. You, you said parent coaching? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's so, a, that's so you mean they don't do. just drop off the kids and sayonara? No, nah, we, we have. <laughs> so that whole, that whole um, uh, consent thing, that whole thing about um, we only work with people who want the help. Sometimes kids have really struggled for a long time. You talked about your chip on your, the chip on your shoulder. Yeah. You're like, fuck this. Fuck you. I'm done. I'm out. I'm yeah. not going to be a part of this shit. How many times did you have to go through shitty experiences before they, before you're like, I'm done with this. Mm -hmm. How long were you like actually engaged before you decided you weren't anymore? Mm -hmm. And so if a parent is working with somebody, either maybe they're a little too young to understand the, like, the implications and, and, and um, uh, about learning about their brain and, and maybe why it might be having a different different method is, it might be better for them yeah um or if maybe kids gone through so much shit for so long that they've tapped out and they're just not willing to engage we can work with the parent to say here's how you can support them yeah until either they're ready or or some some ways that you can help help support them um in their journey okay that's very powerful but you when you just said there was a point where uh, you stop giving a fuck or stop trying. I, I clear, you know what's fucking crazy, dude? Like, a, a memory very clear back to elementary school came back where I had this little book about a dinosaur that I so badly wanted to fucking read. Like, I didn't, it's not that I didn't like reading. Um, I knew how to read, but like, I, I think as early as that, like, I was so interested in these books. I fucking. Like, even to this day, like, you know, I, I see books and I'm like, damn, I genuinely want to read this book. Right? But it's like one of the hardest things for me to sit down and give something like that much attention. You know, it, it, it's very hard. Um, it doesn't matter how badly I want to read the book, but I just I, like I wonder, like, if somebody recognized that in me in elementary school and taught me a tactic or taught me like, don't fucking sit down. Why sit? Uh. Walk. Like, like, walk in circles, hold the book, and go in circles, do laps. Holy crap. I, I love to read. I, one of the, the things I am so grateful to my parents for... Woo, somebody's drifting. Go, you have fun. Um, uh, take it to the racetrack, though. Uh, one of the things I'm so grateful to my parents for is, is teaching me the beauty of, of books and, and learning to love it from a young age mm -hmm. so that, like, I was one of the few things I could physically stop doing, like stop to be able to do. The rest of it, like I was always moving, I was always running. But at this point, it's so much easier for me if I'm working in the garden and digging and listening to a readout of the book, why sit to read if that's not what you need? Yeah. So this is what goals is about. Goals is about figure out your brain, what works for your brain. If sitting down to read, doesn't work, well, don't fucking do it. <laughs> like, yeah. yes, read, but don't do it sitting down. Yeah. Like, do it while doing a wall sit. Do it while, like, <laughs> do it in spurts of, like, three minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's so interesting, man. Okay, so now, like, and, and I kind of want to switch more to the business side right now, but before we do that, like, the people who are listening to this have children. Uh, some of them are probably, like, struggling. If you could give, like, the number one tactic that, like, anybody could replicate from anywhere, like, what's the number one tactic? And obviously everybody's different, okay? Sure. But, like, what's the one thing where if, like, okay, my kid is struggling to pay attention uh, to their homework, so homework, I think that's a big one. 
my kid is struggling to like just get their homework done. What is the one thing as a parent that I could do to empower my, my child to help them finish their homework? Understand why it matters. Hmm. Like, it, <laughs> so much of what we do with kids is directing them and telling them what to do. And, and, and that's, that's our job. Our job is to support them to, to grow and develop and learn and, like, and help them with the decisions they, they, they don't know enough to make on their own. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we often forget to do enough of is guide them to understand why things are important and help them learn to make those decisions for themselves that are best for them. Mm. Um, and so uh, if they're not stupid, talk to them enough, talk to them long enough, explain it multiple times over many, many iterations, why reading is so good, why, why X is so powerful, um, and help them understand why math matters. And if you don't know for yourself, because I believe there is beauty and something powerful brought to our society to learn higher maths than ma multiplication, addition, subtraction, mm -hmm. um, division. There are ways of thinking that are good for our voting public to, to have, even if you don't have to do that on a daily basis, understanding the way it broadens the mind is powerful and is useful, mm -hmm. but we don't teach people that. The reasoning involved in, in mathematics is the same kind of if this then that logic that is important to understanding the basic argument of, of, like, of making choices as a voter. Mm -hmm. And so give them the support to understand why these things matter and also help them understand. And this is, this is one, of, one of my personal life missions is to have people understand that you don't have to do it the same way everybody else did because there's a standard curve, a, a normal curve, and on average people tend to be within this area X percentage wise, like, so what? If, if, if you're over here for this, well, use a strategy that works really well for somebody whose brain is way over here for this. Or yeah. work, figure, put the work into figuring out how your brain works and come up with your own ways of winning. It's, it's the old Sinatra song, I did it my way. I did like, it my way. <laughs> just I gotta figure out, that. Figure that out cool. how, to, how to do it your way. So speaking about doing it your way, right? So goals. Um, you know, you say when you, you say little company, but like, how many employees do you have right now at goals total? Um, employees. Do, uh, you know. uh, truly, honestly, I, I I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, it's more than thirty. Um, which is really good, by the way, because when he says little, like, you know, because I've asked you, you're like, yeah, we're a little business. Like, dude, you're in one of the most competitive markets in the world, number one. You're in fucking Cupertino. <laughs> okay, that's a very, that, that alone is, is huge. Um, the fact that you are feeding 30 mouths through this business is fucking awesome. It's incredible. Um, yeah, but, pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, you know, you didn't start this way. Yeah. Right? Like, you, you're actually, so, like... Well, last time we were talking, like, um, you know, this is this like your first success, like successful business that you've had? This is not my first business. Um, successful. Depend, depends on how you, uh, depends on how you determine successful. Financially They're, successful. Depends on how you determine that. Like I have <laughs> fed myself on other businesses, um, but this is, this is the most successful business that I've okay. had. Yes. So, so um, what was the, uh, what was the learning curve to, to getting here? I don't want to say failures. It was a learning curve. Oh, my God. There, there are plenty of failures. Oh, I've d done so many <laughs> dumb things. It was like, wow, I, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> um, so it started off very accidentally. I did not, I did not plan on building a, a, a business. I was, I was doing research, and I, um, I just I missed kids. I missed teaching. I used to coach rock climbing, um, and I was working in the lab all the time, and it was quiet and dark, and, um, and it was cool. Science is cool, uh, but I did, miss, I did miss kids. 
Um, and so I started sort of traditional tutoring on the side, and I started bringing in what I learned from neuroscience into it. And, it. and I found that if you worked with people to help them understand how their brain was processing information most efficiently and teach them how to teach themselves and then help them get in the habits of doing the things that work, blah, 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 all that stuff, it was like su substantially more successful than just teaching them the things. Um, and so it just sort of grew and blew up and exploded and, um, and, and it, it sort of turned into what it did. Um, but I, I, at first I didn't know whether or not I could teach somebody else to do the things that I was doing. I've mm. had a really weird life. I, I did transplant surgery, I did like, it's like I've had such a weird diverse set of experiences that I didn't know that like I could, I could sort of operationalize um, how, to, how to do this stuff. Um, and so um, it took a while, it took figuring out how to efficiently train others to, to do at least pieces and then how to build a team uh, that supported each other um, and was able to sort of like direct and, and give the right supports from the right person to, to, to help people with, with what they needed. So um, there was a whole lot of, whole lot of journey. Um, uh, in fact, one of the things that Richard hel has helped me with so much was learning how to set up an efficient hiring system mm. um, yeah. that, uh, especially here in Silicon Valley, um, uh, hiring really high quality, good talent, and then um, is, can be a challenge. Um, and uh, how do you filter through the, the, the applications that come in in a way that, that makes sense and, and is, is um, and like when and all of the, those bits and pieces. You know what's funny about that? <clears throat> Richard, he has, so Richard had been coaching me, like that's, that's the main thing that Richard coached me with, uh, coached me on when we first were working together years ago. Uh, he taught me how to hire people. Uh, even more important than how to hire people is how to fire people properly, uh, how, to, how to develop them. Um, and pretty much like the HR recruitment side, Richard was like, the foundational, like I, I still do things to this day that Richard taught me when it comes to uh, HR and recruitment. Richard has also fucking kept me out of uh, court. Um, I accidentally forgot to um, fire somebody, mailed them a check. Uh, my handwriting is fucking sloppy. So like the one looked like a seven, right? Uh, it got sent back and uh, I got, I, I totally forgot to resend the check. And next thing you know, we're in court getting sued by the guy. Uh, and, you know, there's fees that uh, you have to pay every single day that, um, you know, the person didn't get their money. And uh, Richard got us out without uh, having to pay anything, except for the original check amount. Um, and to the, now I run a fucking recruitment company, which just, like, blows my mind because uh, that's what Richard, like, what he, what he just said is literally, like, what he just taught me and what I'm doing now. So coming back. Yes. Um... Squirrel, I, I forgot where we were. At. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so uh, we were talking about uh, actually. Hold on, uh, learning, curve. learning curve. So we're talking about learning curve. We're see. Sometimes I need help too. Um, <clears throat> okay, so mm, mm, mm. oh right. So yeah, when it comes to business, uh, you had to learn how to uh, train others. Uh, get yes. your operations down. Yeah. All right. So, so here's here's the other thing that like really hard for me, and I've heard for many other business owners, is um, how to let go mm. um, and not be micromanaging all of the pieces, mm -hmm. um, and really look at yourself and utilize yourself as a resource to your organization. Mm. What are you good at? What are what are the pieces that you bring that are of significant value? Um, and what are the pieces that you bring of significant value that maybe others don't have to the same degree? And so pass off those things that you can and all of those things that you can. Mm -hmm. Develop others so that they can support those and, and take and run with it. Um, and um, and and so you can do the thing that you do best. What was the scariest part to let go? Oh my God. So the day-to-day -day assessment and 
day-to-day -day management of, of the cases. So I needed to know for the longest time, like way past when it was beneficial to the organization, I needed to know everything going on with every one of our kids mm -hmm. to make sure that the trajectory for every piece of every, their case was going right. And that, that's, that's, that's not efficient. That's not a good use of time. And, and, and it's also disrespectful. That was disrespectful to one of my employees. They were good. I, we set up systems and we trained and we've got systems that teach people how to do the things. And, and we also are really good at hiring really smart, really powerful, really brilliant, really experienced people that bring very useful, yeah, that, that they, they can do this. Yeah. Need to trust them and believe in them and believe in my management team to manage the, the, the quality of these. I just, I just love these kids so much, I want to make sure that it goes right. Uh -huh. But, it's, but my, my team is so good, it's better, especially, um, I am not the best manager in the world. I am, yeah, I am a, a, a <laughs> high level thinker, I see the 30,000 foot view, I see, see the way markets work, I, I, I understand how to do things that a lot of, that many on my management team don't. I see this big picture and how these all come together and I'm the vision. Um, but I but hire people, I hire people who are better than me. And I need, and I, learning to trust them to be better than me yeah. was so important. And also a big key to us really being able to grow as we have. Dude, I love that. And as you're, ta as you're talking about that, <clears throat> I'm thinking about all the different parts of my business that I had trouble letting go, like as the business grew. Um, starting with the very first one was interviewing people. I was like, man, I'm the best interviewer. <laughs> I, I could, and I still believe that to this day, but it's just not a good use of my time. And then teaching my team how to interview, and then eventually getting a software for interviews, and then you know getting a, a, be a better process. And there's been, uh, and then eventually like client communication. Like, no, I'm the best client communicator. Like, because our our our, our our business is like low client uh, volume. You know what I mean? Like, we we don't we can make you know uh, ten million dollars with you know sixty clients, right? Like, we don't need a whole lot. Um, and at first I wanted to be in every interaction, every email, every, every text message, but I'm bipolar. So I'm really like when I'm on and especially when I'm like manic, man, I will bug the shit out of my clients. What's going on? Everything good with that person? <laughs> you know, like I'll, I'll follow up on everything. But as soon as I have my like, you know, month, two month, three month crash, downhill, yeah, everything goes to shit. And then my, you know, my text messages get backed up and right. So then I hire people who are, uh, probably, uh, uh, neurotypical, right? They're stable, right? They're more stable. They're not, they, of course, they get depressed, but they're not like me where they fall off the face of the planet. And also, too, you know what? There's something about, there's something about, there's a big difference between, like, there's a big difference between being someone bipolar who is an employee and someone who's bipolar as an entrepreneur. There's a big fucking difference because if I work for you, I can't just be gone for three months. Like I, I, I have that pressure of like, I need to report into work and I need to go do my work. And I will, you know, I think employees will, are more likely to push themselves through whatever it is that they're going through because, you know, that's just how it is. But when it comes to being an entrepreneur, like, dude, nobody's like behind us saying, what the fuck, where are you at? Well, how come you didn't show up to the meeting? Like, we're the bosses, you know, like we're, nobody's there for that. So... But uh, but yeah, man. So the last, uh, the la the very last piece that I uh, had to learn to let go of was the one that I kept like close to my, close to the chest, you know, because it, it was so difficult for me to imagine somebody else knowing how much money I'm making. It was so hard for me to like, you know, especially like somebody in the Philippines, right? Where like at the cost that I'm paying someone, like, and it's it's more of like internal disbelief. Like if I'm paying someone a couple hundred bucks per month and they're seeing fucking, you know, $150,000 plus per month in billing, I feel like that person's going to resent me. That's what I thought originally. But I've found the opposite. They've, they feel like they have a lot of responsibility on their hands. 
they feel like perfection is something that they need to strive for. Um, and that was like the very- Your team is amazing. <sighs> yeah, your team has been so good for our, for our growth too. Thank you. Yeah, and, and they're, they're, man, my, I, I, I got very lucky and I don't deserve anybody who's on my team. They're fucking awesome. Um, but, but that last numbers part, man, who like, you know, I used to want to do the billing for all of my clients to make sure like, I used to think like, if I'm off by like a hundred bucks on an invoice, like Phil's going to kill me. <laughs> like, I mean, and it's funny too, like it got to the point where like you and I didn't even know each other. Like we, we didn't even know each other until, uh, until I came here and shot a testimonial video and you had only been dealing with my team. And that was something like when, when that started happening with clients where we would get clients that I would never meet, it was just so weird to me. Like, yeah. like I would yeah. like, I have a, I have yeah. like a naturally like negative mindset where I walk into something I'm like this person probably hates me. Like, Hey, what's going on, man? Oh, you don't hate me. Oh, you're kind of cool. Oh, we're the next thing we're like best friends. Right. But like, I have always had like this, something's gotta be wrong. You internalize the trauma from childhood. Like you, all, all of that shit of like school, not, not going the way that, yeah, that you, that society says it's supposed to go and all of that, like it's, it, it dealt with a lot of shit and it, um, it's coming out in business now. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, but again, I'm like lucky. I'm just lucky that I, um, you know, I've, I've built this business and I, 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 I talk about it constantly. Like this business is just a coping mechanism for my neurodiversity. That's, that's what it is. It's like, it's, it's my way. It's my, it's my fucking walking while reading, you know, like this is how, this is how I do things. But, um, but with that being said, man, we, uh, so we're, we're right here, right at the end of this. Um, you know, I'm going to call this part one, man, because we're going to have to fuck, we're going to have to pick this back up. You, you, you might have to be part of a, like, I'm, I'm going to start doing like four, uh, four people discussions on like a topic, you know, uh, which would be really interesting to see you in one. Um, but, um, there's, you know, someone who's like watching this right now, uh, they're probably like listening to this and like, damn, like they're neurotypical, maybe fucking so am I. And maybe this is the first time they're hearing that in their life. And maybe they heard things that we said today that completely resonated with them, but they're thinking about giving up on their dreams of owning a business of one day having, uh, I'll say the freedom like we do to, you know, give our business to uh, our team so that we can focus on the bigger picture. Like, what do you say to that person listening? Uh, don't give up on that dream. You figure out w what your mission is and think through how to get it. And don't give up until you get it. Um, you have something to bring. You have something of significant value. And don't, don't internalize any previous challenges that you've had that, for that to mean that you can't. Just um, uh, some, some uh, what was it, um, Edison, I found a thousand ways to not make a light bulb um, uh, and until he eventually did. Um, so just keep, keep moving on, keep, keep trying. Um, one of the things I've loved about Silicon Valley and having grown up in Silicon Valley is um, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, like start a business, it crashes. So what? Just keep going until eventually you hit something that does work. And, um, and so, and just keep your eyes open and learn from every one of those mistakes and figure out um, what, your, what your process is, what your way is. Love that. Um, now, this is, uh, so normally my guests have, are pretty active on Instagram. However, you're low key. Uh, but if somebody, you know, listen, if somebody's listened to this whole thing for an hour, Okay, and they want to reach out to you for mentorship or just, I don't know, for any reason at all. I feel like they might deserve to get at least an email or something. Yeah, um, goals at goalorientedacademics.com. Um, uh, just send an email there um, and it'll, it'll get to me and uh, happy, to, happy to talk with you. Awesome, man. Well, Phil, thank you so much for hopping on, brother. That's it.